Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our fourth, uh, uh, fourth installment of the HKS conversation series titled Can the Israeli Conflict, Israeli-Palestinian Conflict Be Resolved? Question mark. Um, I'm really delighted today to have with us Yoram Maital. Yoram is the chairman of the Chaim Herzog Center for Middle East Studies and Diplomacy and senior lecturer at Middle East Studies at Ben Gurion University in Beersheba. He's now a visiting fellow at the, uh, at the Islamic Legal Studies program. He earned his BA, MA, and PhD in Middle East History at Haifa University and held a postdoctoral position at St. Anthony's Col College in Oxford. He was a distinguished visiting professor at Northeastern University and the Greenberg Middle East Scholar in Residence at Skidmore College. Um, his most recent book is this one, which is a fantastic book called Peace in Tatters, which I highly recommend uh, that you read. And today, Yoram is going to be talking about the Iron Wall 2012, Israel and the Arab Transformation. Uh, thank you very much, Yoram, and welcome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you uh, so much, Diana, for uh, this very kind, brief introduction. Mm -hmm. We're mostly hearing a lot of, you know, about the, the, the speaker and then have not that much of time for the lecture. <laughs> so uh, I'm delighted to speak before this esteemed seminar. I participated, I think, twice at least and enjoyed it um, uh, very much. So the main, uh, I will jump right to the uh, this troubled water of what is your argument. So the main argument of my talk is that the Arab transformation, I do not use this term Arab Spring. So when I'm saying Arab transformation, you know I mean what in the media is called Arab Spring. So the main uh, argument is that the Arab transformation has significantly changed Israel's geopolitical stand and it provided its leadership with an opportunity to adopt a policy that I will call this evening the Iron Wall 2011-2012. So this is the frame of our, our talk. I will focus on mainly uh, three parts or issues in this presentation. First, Israel uh, views of the Arab transformation. Um, how Israelis, different sectors, not only decision makers, have seen this historical development. Uh, two, changes in Israel's geopolitical stand, what I mean by changes in geopolitical stance. So there are many, many layers in, in this geopolitical uh, stand. I would uh, give that much of attention to the triangle of relations, tensions in between Israel the Palestinian and Egypt. This triangle I, I would like to take as um, an interesting perspective and a very telling one to uh, maybe assist us to understand what is this claim on new iron wall. And the third and last um, is exactly about what I see as or where I see this iron wall uh, materialized. Where? Where to look? So these are the three, you have the argument, hopefully now, and you have the three layers that I would like to uh, address in my talk. So let's start with the uh, initial response by most Israelis, and not all of course, you know, I'm doing here some generalizations over a very complex society, as we all know very well. So I would say that, at large, uh, at the very beginning, the first two, maybe three months of the popular uprising, Tunisia and then Egypt, 
and then some other places, just beginnings of popular uprising, uh, by most Israeli uh, citizens and leadership, uh, I would say that the response was like a combination of fear and astonishment. But first was, first was fear. Very deep fear. For uh, exactly um, the most characteristic of the Arab um, uh, upspring, and this was fear that now we do not have this situation that you can make deal with uh, rulers, regimes, most of them autocratic, authoritarian regimes, but now you have voices and maybe leadership that is coming bottom up, it's coming from within the society, and people in Israel fully aware what is the image of Israel in the eyes of most of the Arab societies and what most Arab non-governmental movements and parties think about Israel's policy in general. So the fear was, and it was coming exactly from, from the point that most people in all over the world saw as the most promising one, that it's coming bottom up, that finally we will have the voice of the people, and not only of few among millions, tens of millions of people who have been ruled by these autocratic regimes. So in Israel, the, the, the response by many was almost the opposite from what in the Arab societies and other places all over the world from this uprising, popular uh, uh, uprising. Astonishment by, by not few Israelis was part of this, was very, very complex. So you have fear and in the very beginning astonishment. How this happened? How this Arabs, in a very orientalistic perception, how these Arabs, dismissive, uh, in the eyes of most Israelis, primitive, uh, knows nothing about, uh, you know, facing the regime, uh, how from all people they dare to do and successfully in doing such astonishment, uprising, like we have seen in Tahrir Square and not only in Tahrir Square. So you have this, this mix of, of, uh, of feelings. So uh, if we just take two examples, one is by Sever Plotzker, a very prominent and very influential journalist in Israel. He's writing in Yediot Achronot, which is the most popular up until recently uh, uh, daily newspaper and you can see this our fear is of a democracy which mer is merely a transitory to st stage on the way to a new dictatorship based on fanatic Islam so I'm first using here the word Islam if you have something that terrifying Israelis you got right to this Islam not as a religion but political Islam political Islam, identified with, uh, first and foremost, with the Muslim Brotherhood uh, movement. At that time, no one took seriously, even not experts, that Salafists will have this uh, show in elections and, and all this. So it was all about Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, if you take uh, Shaul Mufaz, a uh, hot name, you know now, that is leading the Kadima party, uh, his comment, and he uh, uh, had several of this sort of comments, um, was very reflective of not few Israelis who actually connect between Iran's Ahmadinejad's policy and Hamas, or and the Muslim Brothers in general. Now, of course, uh, anyone who follows the event uh, knows perfectly that this connection 
is is very weak, in, and this is using a very mild um, uh, observation uh, uh, about it. Now, this uh, initial perception has changed very fast, very fast, and since I would say beginning of the last summer, May, June 2011, so a year from where we stand today, uh, most Israelis believe that Arab Spring is turning into an Islamic winter. And these are the, the wording of the very wording that are most common in the Israeli media. Don't say Arab Spring or Yoram don't say Arab Transformation, say Islamic winter. And um, if we uh, just have uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, later on, following actually the, this uh, discourse within the Israeli society, uh, coming to uh, the Knesset and giving a very interesting um, uh, a statement about how leadership, especially this leadership, the right-wing led coalition by uh, uh, the Likud, see the uh, uh, unfolding events in, in, in the Middle East. So it's a very, very, uh, I would say, impressive and detailed uh, statement that he uh, released in uh, November 24 uh, last year in the Knesset. He said the chances are that an Islamist wave will wash over the Arab countries an anti-West, anti-liberal, I mark this anti-liberal, that of course means that Islam could not be uh, flexible enough to actually meet uh, our whatever values of liberalism, democracy, uh, and everything encapsulating in, in this. And of course anti-Israel uh, and the bottom line anti-democratic anti wave. Now, this is in the very heart of the transformative process. There are many, many, many challenges. This is not the, uh, precisely the, the topic that I'm addressing here, but we all understand that the Middle East is shaken by this historical move. And the, at, at this point, less than a year to the uprising, to the popular uprising, Israel's leadership actually uh, drew this conclusion that it's all um, fini, it's all uh, already done. Uh, we are getting into some very problematic uh, uh, situation uh, following the, uh, uh, this uh, um, Arab uh, um, spring or whatever. Uh, now, the, as, as part of this discourse, we should give much attention to the question that many uh, in the media ask themselves and ask the leadership, including Netanyahu. So, would you say you prefer an autocratic, non-democratic regime over a democratic Arab regime or society? And now Netanyahu got into some very difficult situation with these questions. Because for many years, he actually raised this call for or upon the Arabs we cannot get into peace process with you until you get democracy. So now the point here in the Israeli discourse to the Prime Minister was, okay, so where you stand now with this view that all this is anti-democratic way, what is your, your argument? Um, the bottom line that Netanyahu gave, and this, he's very good in, in you know, public media, talking and, and maybe convincing, uh, partly in Israel, brilliantly here in the United States. Uh, so he said, uh, as a response, the Arabs are not moving forward toward progress, meaning democracy, liberal values, whatever. Uh, they are going backward. Now, let's 
cross to uh, uh, Arab uh, transformation implications on Israel and its policy. First and foremost, the Arab transformation has significantly, as I said at the very beginning, this is my premise, has changed Israel's geopolitical stand, is actually manifested first and foremost in the triangle angle that I'm presenting here, Egypt, Palestinian territories, um, and, and, uh, and, 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 and then, uh, if I, when I said Egypt uh, first, I would say that, um, of course, uh, while we talk about uh, geopolitics and Israel, well, at least since March 1979, this is 33 years, most of Israel's geopolitical premises and policy have been based on peace treaty with Egypt. This is, this is the core of Israel's security and policy guidelines. Everything that you can consider during the last three or more decades have been built on this pillar that you have a peace treaty with Egypt, the biggest Arab country with huge influence on the Arab system and especially on the Palestinian fight or, or issue. And then we're talking here historically. We're not talking just about Sadat's time or Mubarak or, or whatever. The link between Palestine and Egypt is very instrumental historically. And in Israel, the first to appreciate it was Menachem Begin. He understood it. He wanted to take it to his own court by this assumption, I can say false assumption, that if you strike a deal with Egypt, then this separate peace would um, um, uh, lead to uh, uh, compensate Israel by having control over the Palestinian issue or territories uh, just by giving some leeway by promising the Palestinians self-autonomy uh, um, or, or something like that. Uh, once Begin uh, uh, described it in a very metaphorically uh, way, he said it uh, when he asked, well, what is this uh, uh, self-autonomy you're having in mind? They would like to have um, a flag. They would like to have uh, a state. Uh, he said they can have a flag. They can have uh, a state. They can call themselves a state. Even uh, they can have a president, anything they want, but they will not have control over the territory, the land itself. He said, it's like you can be up, up in the air a few centimeters. You will feel that this belongs to you, but you up in the air and we will control the land. This is the concessions that we can make most with the Palestinians in accordance to uh, uh, Menachem, Menachem Begin. Now, Egypt considerably changed uh, uh, since toppling uh, Mubarak in terms of Israel, Palestine, first and foremost. It comes into how Egypt looked into Gaza Strip as part of a new perspective over Egyptian view of the Palestinian file in, in general. So Egypt uh, took measures uh, to prevent, during, during Mubarak's time, just brief, Egypt actually, uh, I would say, um, indirect or in, the, in, in a very direct way, uh, cooperate with uh, Israel under different uh, governments, Israeli uh, governments. Uh, this came um, basically as part of Egyptian view of Hamas and uh, uh, support of the PA under Arafat and then uh, under uh, uh, Abbas. Uh, and getting into this conflict, this internal conflict, clash of agendas, uh, Egypt took side. And the side was actually very hostile to Hamas. And um, in addition to this, uh, Egypt uh, saw the possibility of having uh, Hamas rule over Gaza as a threat 
to Egyptian national security, which is in addition to this view over, uh, uh, over who to side with in this internal conflict. So it was just, it was also part of how the Mubarak's regime saw Hamas as in part a risk, if not to say a threat, to Egyptian national security, Hamas controlling uh, Gaza. So in, as part of this, uh, the Mubarak regime um, um, uh, tried uh, to prevent arms smuggling from Sinai, but this was just one side of the story. The more impressive one was actually the way that they operated uh, the Rafah uh, crossing, uh, just the only crossing between the Gaza Strip and non-Israeli uh, border um, uh, of, uh, of the Gaza Strip. So uh, uh, when I, 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 I just mentioned in this slide, Gaza Strip and Sinai, uh, these all uh, have dramatically, dramatically changed with the collapse of the Mubarak uh, regime. It has several layers. So it's not only that Egypt opened a new page with Hamas, which is obvious, obvious up there from the very beginning of the uh, uh, new government uh, in Egypt, this transitional uh, uh, government. Uh, so first, opening, uh, they opened a new page with Hamas. They put a lot of pressure on the PA just by this move. It's a huge, enormous pressure of the, on the PA. I mean, your main supporter is actually now um, giving a hand, if not more than this, assistance to your rivals, your political rival. And uh, so this is the first thing. And as for Israel, the new Egyptian policy was first and foremost uh, uh, exemplify uh, the end of the, uh, I would say, the siege uh, perception. The, 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 just the possibility that you can, you can turn Gaza into a huge prison, that you can close all the borders, uh, you have a, a wall or a fence or whatever, and uh, you have crossings uh, that Israel control uh, border between Gaza Strip and Israel, four crossings, and you have one in Rafah. In the other side, you have the Egyptian, the Mubarak regime. So all this have actually was not relevant anymore by the beginning of talk and then coordinate, coordination between Cairo and Hamas leadership with all the difficulties, Hamas in Gaza, Hamas outside Gaza, Mish'al or not Mish'al, they worked with all of them. And this was a new political game in between Egypt and the Palestinian file. The reconciliation could not have been signed without this new uh, dynamic. Yes, it, it is far from being realized and materialized. We know all the difficulties, but Egyptians uh, start uh, playing a different role in this uh, uh, situation. Now, in addition to this, what we have seen, I did something wrong, that is some bit, oh, oh, okay. So, uh, in addition to this, uh, uh, there was a huge question that has to do with um, uh, uh, this issue of Israel geopolitical stand and the peace treaty between the two states, Egypt and, and Israel. So, as I, I mentioned at the very beginning, for, from the Israeli perspective, the peace treaty is a pillar. It's a pillar. So, naturally, uh, the first question that decision makers asked and the military apparatus try to answer was where the new Egyptian regime stands in terms of the peace treaty. Where are they? What are the signs they sending over to us? Now, as part of the Israeli reading of the situation was coming from, from fear, as I described, so when SCAF, the, the, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, SCAF, in Egypt, 
uh, announced that they uh, respect all international commitments that Egypt had taken upon themselves, including the peace treaty with Israel, well, in Israel there was some relief, but fear was not going any way. Because most Israelis rightly understood that political Islam is going to play a significant role. And then, this is before elections to the parliament in Egypt, Israelis ask, what if, what if the Islamists win elections? What, what, what then? Are scarf to face the parliament and maybe the government and enforce on them some terms or maybe the opposite will be realized. So it's a very, very basic, basic question with a lot of uh, impacts and ramifications. Now, what is very interesting to see that uh, this trust is playing enormous role, not only between Israeli and Palestinians, but also between Israelis and Egyptians. And one example, the Muslim Brotherhood leadership actually pushed to the corner before election to the parliament and especially after they, they won the elections about this very precise question. What about the peace with Israel? If we read your rhetoric, read your statements, now for many years, since the beginning of the peace treaty, you were against the peace treaty. You criticized Israel, and not only Israel, but the Mubarak's regime, and before him, Sadat, for signing this peace treaty. So where you stand now, that you are the biggest political party in Egypt. Now the answer was extremely interesting. They repeated word by word Scaf's statements, saying, we bind by international commitment, we're having our own criticism on Israel, but we are now in a different context. We are having the duty of being the biggest political party in Egypt, so we will respect commitment that the state, not us, but the state, had taken, and when they pushed harder on this, they said, we will try, this is not for sure that we succeed on this, but we will try to put some amendments into this separate peace. And we will have our criticism on Israel. Now in Israel, the reading of these statements was a mix, some relief, but at the same time, a lot of concerns. There's a distrust, a huge distrust toward political Islam movement, and, um, and, and we are still in this, I would say, in general, uh, uh, atmosphere. Uh, the major issue is, of course, that Israel, very much like Egypt, view the United States as an instrumental partner to this peace treaty. So Israel immediately uh, worked with the administration here, with the Obama administration, about uh, getting as much uh, assurances, commitments, that any Egyptian government will not change the basic commitment to the peace treaty, and if this happened, then that the problem is not between Egypt and Israel, but with the American administration. And we have this, uh, uh, I would say, uh, strategic uh, uh, understanding between uh, Israel's government and the American, I'm, I'm saying American administration to say this is not only the Obama administration uh, with this regard, that the United States see the peace treaty as instrumental to its Middle Eastern policy and not only that, okay, this is, uh, it was good for 30 years, and now we can, you know, reshuffle the cards, and uh, Allah alam, God knows what will happen. No, they're saying no. Uh, we will put all our efforts and weight on any Egyptian leadership to uh, get committed to this uh, uh, peace treaty 
um, because it is part of the American Pax Americana uh, in the region, with all the difficulties and the problematic perspective that embodied in this Pax, um, uh, Pax Americana. Uh, just a word about Sinai. So Sinai getting into some huge concern in the eyes of Israel. Huge concern. There is no doubt that the secu in terms of security, the situation in Sinai uh, has deteriorated in the last or the past a year and a half. There is no doubt about this. Now, Egyptians are more concerned with this than any other of the players. They're terribly concerned with this. But SCAF has, has now a more urgent uh, issues to tackle. And this is first and foremost what is going within Egypt. Sinai is part of Egypt, but what is going on the struggle over the reign of power in Egypt. And we are right now in a very, very dramatic days. It's not only the elections, it's, to my mind, first and foremost, the possibility to write a decent, solid constitution, a new constitution to the state of Egypt. And it will determine all that much of a lot about the coming um, uh, new Egypt, uh, uh, inshallah. It will be ended uh, in, 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 I would say, more inclusive way and not the way that it started as a very exclusive uh, uh, constitutional drafting committee that you have just one voice, basically, uh, going to determine the future of 85 million plus Egyptians and state. Um, so right now they're trying to reshuffle these cards. I don't know how it will be uh, ended. Um, um, I think we should all, Israelis, not Israelis, Arabs in general, uh, should cross fingers and hope that they will cross this stage um, uh, in um, colors, as you're saying here. So, um, the, I'm getting uh, to another point um, um, on the uh, Israeli um, uh, geostrategic uh, uh, perception, and that during, uh, actually since this uh, popular uprising, uh, Israel's leadership, including the uh, uh, security apparatus very influential sector in Israel, uh, continuously re-examining uh, uh, the, sec the National Security Council. I would say that this is going like by a month now, that you have reports about yet another important meeting. And they're really uh, having some uh, huge, huge uh, issues to, to, to challenge and consider, consider and to see where, where to navigate this uh, shift that is called Israel, and what, what direction. Um, so um, what it, it has been and still is at stake is this peace treaty with Israel. This is the first thing they check out about every each of these discussions. And they're trying, uh, of course, to uh, maneuver, as I, I already uh, um, uh, mentioned. Now, it's very, very important to mention that one thing is obvious for this level, decision makers. One thing is very, very clear. And this is that Israel's ability to maneuver First and foremost, in terms of its capability to, uh, capability to use force, but also in the political and diplomatic levels, that this maneuver, uh, ability to maneuver um, uh, has significantly decreased. And this is a huge problem. So just a, a, a very brief reminder. So last August, uh, a terrible attack took place just north of the city of Eilat. Perpetrators came from Sinai. We know very little about who were they, but they know, we know they got from there. We know that Egyptians did not cooperate with them, 
but they launch this attack, they attack a bus, and Israelis have uh, been actually killed, some Egyptians, border security, been killed by Israeli forces, probably mistakenly, I'm not sure, but this is the, uh, uh, the report uh, they released, and the huge crisis started between Egypt and Israel, it ended up by huge demonstration against uh, the peace treaty and against Israel, and some of the demonstrators uh, just walked to the Israeli embassy, put a siege on this building, it's a 12 stories building, in the, very close to uh, uh, Cairo University, to you guys who are familiar with Cairo, and, and they, uh, at the end, after some very tense situation, the Egyptian special forces were able to rescue the security, uh, Israeli security of the embassy. And demonstrations just ran into the embassy, took documents and made the mess. Uh, it was a huge celebration downstairs as for this uh, victory, and the crisis developed, has developed between the two states. I mean, this is nothing uh, uh, to minimize. I mean, embassies are more than just, you know, offices that provide uh, services. Uh, so it's like ex-territorial, and the, the host country should do the utmost to protect uh, embassies. We know the, the protocol uh, of this very well. Uh, but the point here is that since then, um, we are now um, uh, about uh, nine months later on, uh, this file is still open between the two states. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, talks, uh, but it's, it's very much uh, up there, and, um, and demonstrating against Israel is, is something with a lot of symbols within it. Yet another, just brief example, last Friday, Cairo, and not only Cairo, several other cities all over the Republic, um, so demonstrations against Umar Suleiman. Umar Suleiman. Protesters in Tahrir Square actually had banners, photo of Omar Suleiman and the Israeli flag. In one. In one. Just to show you how the discourse is constructed and deconstructed by simple people or political parties. Now these demonstrations mostly had organized by the Muslim Brothers and the Salafists. In Israel, if we're going back, you can see why fear had grown as respond to this. So the situation is that we are yet again in this dynamic that even if Israelis listen and maybe accept that Egypt is going to uh, uh, respect peace treaty with Israel, still uh, fears and on the ground uh, operations or move could make uh, a lot of tensions between these two, uh, uh, two sides. But just to close this uh, point about the, uh, Israel's ability to maneuver, just after the operation near Elat that I mentioned, in Israel, the public demand was hit Gaza. They came from there. They crossed over Sinai and they attacked us. Hit Gaza was a huge, huge cry in Israel. Some of the cabinet supported this, including Lieberman, very influential political persona. Many among the Likud party supported this. At the end of the long discussions in the cabinet and the security apparatus, what made the difference was how this is going to affect the peace treaty with Egypt. So it, it is not anymore 
this uh, two sides, two parties, Israel, Palestine, or Palestinians, especially Hamas or groups in Gaza Strip, but now we are having a new equation here. No more like Israel-Palestine, you have the strongest mighty army, you have the Palestinians, now it's by far more complex. No one can tell what would have been the Egyptian response if Israel decided to attack. Maybe the outcome by Egyptians uh, was just, you know, like um, uh, critique and, and uh, maybe they will call back the ambassador, but nothing serious. But Israel could not take the chance that it will stop there. And it's, it's, like, it's like this new dynamic that I repeatedly discuss in other venues here about what is the power of the Muslim Brotherhood and what is the power of the movements of the youth. They are not in the parliament. So I, my argument is that the youth power is that they know the power of Tahrir and the road to Tahrir Square. They are not in the parliament. But they know that what is uh, extremely influ influential and important today is who controls Tahrir Square. And not only who is sitting in the parliament. So for Israel, the equivalent is that maybe the Palestinians in Gaza or maybe other players will make it that Egyptian will change their stand more dramatically toward Israel. And this is a risk we could not take, not only from our side, we could not take because at this situation, we will have to face the American administration. Now the understanding now is that the one-on-one -on -one Israel-Palestinians become like a four parties new equation. It's, the Israel, it's Israel, the Palestinian movements or, or parties, the Egyptians, and the Americans. It's like reshuffling the cards from new, and very difficult to predict how they will be on the table on the next, on the next round. Uh, I will cross now uh, to uh, take you to what I see as the Iron Wall 2012, after I discussed this geopolitical uh, situation. Now, most of Israel's cabinet believe that in the light of the dramatic transformation in Arab societies and regime, a period of instability in the Middle East has begun. This is obvious. There's nothing special in this reading. We all agree to this. But uh, they assume that under these circumstances, and here maybe we can see differences, under these circumstances, it is not appropriate to hold negotiations on final status issue with the Palestinians, which involve the taking of risk. And this negotiations is all about taking risk. Now, in other words, Israel should and could maintain the status quo. That's the bottom line. It's about the status quo. So if the Palestinians, the PA, maybe others, believe that the status quo cannot be maintained. And maybe the Americans and maybe the, the, the Europeans think this way. The Israeli would say that uh, the maintain of the status quo is mandatory. Because of the Arab transformation and uh, its, its impact on the geopolitical stand of, of Israel. Now, uh, 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 I would say that uh, uh, um, an echo of, of this um, uh, concept uh, may be found in uh, a speech by Netanyahu. Uh, I guess that most of you remember his talk at the Congress last year and after that the meeting with, uh, uh, with the President 
but for me, it was most interesting to see Netanyahu's statement to us back in Israel. And uh, I, I chose just one uh, um, uh, example. Uh, and this is coming from a discussion about uh, the question. And the question was about possibility to renew uh, a political, I don't like this peace process phrase, so political deliberations uh, with the Americans or through the Americans with the PA. It was a discussion in the Knesset. And Netanyahu was very cynic in this, full of himself, as usual, in the Knesset. Full of himself. And he looked at them, and he laughed on, on you know, other parties and leadership and all this. He said, remember that many of you called upon me to seize the opportunity. And he tried to imitate begging in this. He, he actually, he, he, most of you are not Israelis, I guess. We know how to read it in any of us in, each, in his or her society. You know, these small symbols. He was just laughing about uh, uh, ideas, for example, by Kadima and some of the Labour Party uh, who actually said, this is the time. Why you are having this sit and do nothing policy? This was a quote from this discussion. And he said, oh, I remember he tried to remind us Menachem Begin um, uh, uh, time. So, um, and he said, uh, well, you can read it. It's, it's, it's up um, um, over, well, over there. So you can see it. Now, uh, the point here is, is actually the bottom line. Whoever does not see it is uh, burying their head in the sand. And this is actually to tell us that we, I mean Netanyahu and, and the Likud and you know, the right wing, we actually were the ones who read correctly, not only since 2011, but from the very beginning. So why I'm saying this? Because his example was not about, um, about uh, uh, only uh, having discussions with the Palestinians. He wanted to make reference to Syria. He said, just try to imagine this situation, that you have this uprising, this terrible fighting, and think that the Golan Haid was under control of the Syrians. And maybe you will have hundreds of thousands of Syrians getting there, and maybe from there into Israel or whatever. What then? So I would like to connect this discourse with the creating of atmosphere of fear and suspicion based on false premises and assumptions that are like dark prophecies. Sometimes they can be realized, but I'm not sure that this is the best idea for leaders and leadership to use this as a main tool of policy making, of, you know, just talk to the bottom fears of people. So he came out with, with, with this, and, um, and uh, the whole of the Israeli uh, rhetoric actually has been influenced by similar discussions about, so maybe Netanyahu is right. Maybe we should not take that much of risk. And when the reconciliation uh, agreement was signed between Abbas and Mishal, I think it was in Doha, yeah. um, the discourse uh, in Israel was that he's absolutely right. See what happened. I mean, we used to think that Abbas is the partner, and now he's signing an agreement for making a new government with whom? With what Israel see as the prime enemy, means Hamas, and a prime enemy uh, that has this strong relations 
with the Muslim brothers in Egypt who actually uh, uh, are the biggest political party in Egypt. So the whole of the discourse, uh, I would say, shaken up by this uh, notion that we're getting into unbelievably difficult situation and what we can see coming up uh, inward, Israel is just threats, just risk. Something, or oh, sorry, nothing positive is coming uh, in our direction. Now for people in the right wing, not only in Israel, in any right wing I think, um, this is the, the, the bread and butter to play with. And, and, and the use of it was, uh, to my mind, uh, uh, not only problematic, it has a lot of impact on the policy making itself. It's not only about words, rhetorics, and that's it. And you can say, okay, I mean, Jews like to speak and to talk, and this is from the Talmud, and, and all this. There is, okay, well, no, it's about it getting into, uh, very much into policy making uh, by, the, uh, by the government. Now, to, to fully understand this strategic uh, uh, shift, I would like to share with you the two words uh, at the beginning of my, type, uh, my talk. And this is the Iron Wall. Now, I don't know how, how many among you uh, have the opportunity to read uh, Zev Jabotinsky uh, uh, very important historical piece that he entitled The Iron Wall. This uh, uh, had written in 1923, not today, 25 years before the State of Israel and the Nakba took place, right? 25 years. Now, 90 years has passed since this article, and I cannot stop talking about the influence of this manifest on the Israeli right and some part of the center and the left uh, in Israel. Big mistake to think that only Likud and the right wing share this ideas. Big mistake. Labour Party would endorse it fully. Kadima, of course. So I would say that maybe, maybe several percentage of the Israeli polity would not accept the principles of the Iron Wall. Now the very idea Please have a, a, a minute or two and try to, to, to read it when I, uh, while I, I speak. Uh, is that Jabotinsky had this, this debate. It's a, it's a very intensive debate. In the 1920s, in the 1920s, when Jews in Palestine were a small minority, the debate within the Zionist movement was between basically two approaches. In one hand, you have uh, people like Sokolov, like Weizmann, later on like Ben-Gurion, who would like uh, to get into concessions while they believe that uh, an agreement is achievable and that the con concessions will allow uh, part of the historical land of Israel Eretz Israel to become a safe land for the Jewish people. So this is, this is I would say, the pro-agreement uh, camp. As opposed to this camp, you have mainly Jabotinsky. Mainly Jabotinsky. And the Iron Wall was uh, a statement by this mentor of the right wing and center 
generations of Israelis. He wrote this statement just to uh, uh, introduce the idea why an agreement is portal effort. Why he said it's not moral, it's not moral to send uh, to sign an agreement. He said those of us who believe, those of us who believe that signing an agreement with the Palestinians or the Arabs in general, they, they, their premise is that Arabs and especially the Palestinians are stupid. He said, we can take one lesson from colonialism and the struggle against colonialism. We do not have any one example that the colonized will accept the colonizer by an agreement and that this is durable. This is a very, very strong point that he made here. Now, the, so where he would like to take us? So he said, it's not that I'm saying that an agreement is impossible. He said, it depends on the conditions. And the conditions that exist now and will prolong, continue for many, many decades will not allow us to sign an agreement that will uh, split the land and make what today we call two states solution. So he believed in a one state solution. He said, I believe in a one state solution. It should be a Jewish state and the minorities, first and foremost, the Palestinians, minorities will have equal rights in this state. Uh, for Jabotinsky, you can see the, the first sentence is actually where I, I just stopped. Can, uh, right, a principle of equal rights. Equal rights, citizenship, whatever. Uh, now, the point that um, he would like to make, or the, the next point he would like to make, is about the feasibility. Is it, is it possible to have this sort of um, uh, 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 solution? by peaceful means. So this is the question that we're addressing for decades. Is this conflict can be resolved? This is the question you ask in your seminar, right? So Jabotinsky said that solving the problem by peaceful means heavily depends on the answer of how mighty is the Jewish state. This is his own answer. How mighty is the Jewish state is the precondition for answering the question is a solution is feasible. Now for the answer uh, um, he continued the answer is that what I call the, the mighty Jewish state, for him, this is the, uh, uh, the symbol, or it's symbolized by the Iron Wall. And the point about the Iron Wall is that Iron Wall is not only a military uh, mighty army force even nuclear, although we are before nuclear weapon and all this, but it's not only this in the, in the eye of Jabotinsky. He talked about the, uh, the economy, the technology, high level technology. He talked a lot about spending in education 
and uh, he talked a lot, a lot about the consolidation of the society. That as much as we fight between ourselves, we harm the iron wall. So for him, I would say, this is a long run. This is nothing to be achieved in five years plan, ten years plan. He talked in uh, terms of generations, generations before building the iron wall or having the iron wall stand fear. Then he said we'll be close to the second stage. And the second stage is that Arabs and especially the Palestinians will try to pull down this wall daily by fighting against us. Our mighty will help, but we should get prepared for an ongoing war that will take for generations. The final stage will be one day one day when uh, the Arabs will get to the conclusion that we are we hit our heads on this wall for centuries, decades. And it's very painful. And we tired of this conflict. And we would like to live as human beings and not to exhaust our resources. And at that point, he's saying, Arabs will be ready to accept the most treasurers one, one goal that any Zionist should put on the top of everything. You want to guess? Well, what is it? The one goal. Beyond the, the, this iron wall, one goal in the long run. Recognition. Recognition. Recognize us as the Jewish state. Sounds familiar to you? from somewhere, recognize us as a Jewish state. I can speak here for hours about what I see the psychology of this need for recognition. But I would like just to uh, um, uh, finish uh, my presentation by saying something uh, uh, very, uh, very basic about this. This is Netanyahu uh, yet again speaking um, again to us in Israel. A peace agreement is based first and foremost on the recognition of Israel as a national state of the Jewish people. This is the project. This is the project. The conflict between us and the Palestinians is different from any other conflict Rightly he's saying, because we are fighting for the very same land. The end game for Israel under this leadership, end game, is far from where we stand today. Far away. We are just in the need of this world. If you think that the right wing is very happy today in Israel, they are not happy. They are not happy. For them, they are right now in this brutal conflict and they, pay, and they believe that they are the first to pay the price. Not people like me and Hila, my wife. They pay the price. Not us. Because they fight for the land. And they facing uh, on daily basis sometimes the Palestinians. And for them, the true Zionism is not in Le'avim, where I live, within Israel. It is in Nablus. It is exactly in the Arab part of Jerusalem. This is the true Zionism in their eyes. 
Now, yes, there are many, many concerns that Netanyahu could not do anything he dreamed of, but I think that a solid, uh, a fair reading of the situation, and by this I would uh, like to conclude, is that most of the, most Israelis believe that the broad Arab objection to accept the, uh, that claim uh, Jewish state, Israel Jewish state, challenges the very existence of the state of Israel and reflect the Arab fundamental resistance to accept Israel's sovereignty. Now, this is the way that most Israeli look looking into the question of what is, why they are against a Jewish state. Now, uh, the, the, the very basic, I would say, uh, 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 source of this uh, conception lays in a failure, basic failure to distinguish between the recognition of the state of Israel and recognizing it as a Jewish state. So most of the Israelis and most of the Americans, to my mind, and, the, and including the American, uh, the, the Obama administration, fail to uh, uh, recognize this very basic, uh, important gap between recognition of the state of Israel and recognizing Israel as the Jewish state. And we're having uh, Obama and many, many others in the Congress, outside the Congress, who actually, uh, uh, word by word, repeating Netanyahu's uh, statements on, on, on Israel. As a, why not? I would not uh, try to say that there are no Arabs who deny Israel rights to exist. Of course there are. But I would say something very basic to this. Israel signed peace treaty with Egypt, we already mentioned this, a peace treaty with Jordan, the uh, 1993 uh, agreements with the uh, PLO, before the PA, with the PLO, what is called the Oslo agreements, although there is nothing that historically is called Oslo agreement, or just a statement. Uh, but anyway, it was very important, of course. But in all this, the Arab parties recognized the state of Israel. In all these agreements, none of Israel's leadership ever asked or put it as a precondition that the Arab partner will recognize Israel as the Jewish state. They rightly insist they recognize the state of Israel. To my mind, as an Israeli and not as an expert, the very identity of my own state has nothing to do with an outside recognition. I don't want to impose on the Palestinian their own national identity, symbols, whatever. I don't need any recognition from the Palestinians or the Arabs that I would like to see myself as part of a Jewish state or a not Jewish state if I support a two-state solution, if we get to this, to this point. So my point here is that the very basic claim is part of a conception that I have tried to um, introduce here the basic layers of this uh, uh, discourse, and I think that by this I would stop here and get your comments, questions. Well, uh, we're going to open up for questions, but before... I need uh, something to write. Uh, uh, Oh, okay. um, so I just want to open up by, just on that last 
uh, last Bye. point by going back to that last point. And sort of thinking back historically, I mean, you mentioned that in uh, the agreement that was signed with Egypt and the agreement that was signed with Jordan and the agreements, the Oslo agreements, there was no mention of the idea of a Jewish state. And uh, in fact, even in all of the negotiating history, there was never really a mention of, an, of a Jewish state. It just came out, if I'm remembering correctly, something around 2003. Um, so mm -hmm. it's, it's a new phenomenon. But the problem is, is that you can look back at history, but now the genie is out of the bottle. And I don't think that there's going to be an Israeli leader who's going to be able to put that back into the bottle and say this is no longer a, a, a demand. Um, and so moving forward, if we think about moving forward, there now seems to be a lot more talk of doing some sort of unilateral measure because of the fact that, that the Palestinians will not recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Um, do you see that this is something that is going to pick up inside Israel? Uh, there is, a, I know, a lot of hesitation towards this idea of unilateralism. Do you think, but do you think that this is something that will gain momentum? Unilateralism in the occupied in the, Yes. Well, uh, two issues in, in your question. First, just to slightly correct uh, what you said, um, is actually the opposite from what I try to present here. Uh, by addressing Jabotinsky. So it's historically, historically, Jewish state is up there all the time. All the time. All the time. There's nothing new that Netanyahu is bringing into this aside that he turned this into a precondition for a meaningful deliberations and uh, an agreement if being reached. So this is the difference. But as I put a lot of attention to these historical processes, I would say that the Jewish state is, is up there. I, I, I actually said that these idea, the idea of the Jewish state is uh, shared by the vast majority of Israelis. It's not only the Likud, it's not only you know, these crazy settlers. Or, no, if someone sees this, as a reflection of a tiny, crazy settlers, he is missing the all of the story. And then will be very problematic to understand why they are not getting right, why they are not logic. I mean, what is wrong with these people? The wrong is that we do not give that much of attention to um, something that is more than two days of history. I'm saying this is an historian. I'm an I'm historian. So I'm, I, I live in the past. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, so, but, but this is the first point. The second is about, is about the more I would say, now this is, this is uh, a huge discussion about unilateralism. This is for you, Ahmed, maybe. It's coming for your uh, conference. I would say that I was, I was in this conference on one state at Harvard. Ahmed and Diana, others organized, I guess there's some others were there, uh, Alicia. Um, I was sitting and, and listening for the whole of the day, and most of the speakers, to my mind, minimized or had missed one basic issue. The one state is already in the making. Is already in the making. And the one state is the Jewish state. We can, we can sit and talk about this is not moral, and this is uh, that, and this is something else. I would say even more than this. I think that most of the Americans have accepted the idea that Israel is the Jewish state, and it will stay like this within the lines at least of the uh, separation wall in the West Bank and the situation in Gaza, you all know aware of this situation. So the project is, is on the ground. That we, maybe Netanyahu is right. Most of us are with the head deep in the, in, in the, in, 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 you know, the land. The project is there, is there. Now, the over-focusing on the settlements and the settlers, 
I can understand it, but it is also a misreading of the whole of the, of the, whole of the picture, to my mind. So in one, in, one, in one way, I was extremely happy that people discussed the question of one state. But the notion that the one state could be discussed today outside the prison or this conception of a Jewish state is, to my mind, very partially. Um, thanks so much, Yoram. I found your comments interesting. Just on the last thing you said, um, how rich is the discourse within Israel um, from what you found on what Jewish state means? Because in my experience, working within the Yeshiva movement, uh, working in the, uh, the national religious movement, as well as the secular movement, there's no, there's no understanding of what that terminology yeah. is. It's, uh, yeah. And specifically also in America, just because right. most people here are in this country, yeah. there's no understanding in the American Jewish community also of what that terminology is. Right. Well, first you're absolutely right. I mean, it's like, it's like you have uh, an item in the public debate and we all refer to this item without seriously discussing the content of it, which is very simplistic, of course. But I would say this. Let me give you an example. So Lieberman and his party, Israel Beitenu, they came up with this idea that uh, citizenship could not be dissociated from loyalty. From loyalty. Now, of course, first and foremost, they wanted the uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel to recognize the state of Israel as a Jewish state. So they opened up the, this Pandora box and we had a lot of discussion about it. Now, very interesting comment. He came out not with just I would like to address the Israeli public uh, rhetoric. He is a politician, and he has a project, and he believes in the project. And he, unfortunately, is successful in progressing his project. So he took it to the Knesset. This is the legislative body in Israel. And he wanted it as a law, not as, uh, you know, blah, blah, uh, liberals and fascists talking exchange words. No. He took it to the Knesset. Now, more important than the vote was the, to my mind, was the discussion within the right wing and the, first and foremost, the Likud party. And see this. Benny Begin, the son of Men the late Menachem Begin, Dan Meridor, who is a minister in the cabinet, and Ruby Rivlin, the, uh, the speaker of the Knesset, the three of them representing today this Jabotinsky, uh, ala Jabotinsky perception of the Jewish state. And they said, are we, we, not you, are we, the Likud, out of our mind? And they start spreading iron wall to people. Read it. It's about equal rights. There is nothing about loyalty. Jabotinki said they are Arabs. They should continue being Arabs. They have their identity. He talked about something very close to cultural autonomy. It's there in this manifest. He said, are we to vote for loyalty and citizenship? Of course not. So the struggle within the Likud was uh, impressive, impressive and a very telling one. Now, of course, this is an ongoing, as you said, rightly, this is an ongoing debate. The day that we will see um, 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 renewal of serious negotiations, I guess that this debate will uh, get more attention, including in Israel. But right, right now, I mean, during the last year or two years now, I mean, no one in Israel is that naive to think that uh, uh, Fayyad uh, talk with uh, Netanyahu will open serious negotiations. And no one really listening to these people who are uh, demonstrating for renewal what is called the peace process. It's, it's, not, it's not an issue in the Israeli uh, public debate today. Is it an issue in Obama's uh, 
uh, agenda? Uh, well, I'm not sure. I mean, it's there, yes. And you have these photo ops, and you have some sort of exchanges. But uh, it's not there. See, see the comments on when very recently Abbas sent this message to Netanyahu, and Israeli read this as a threat. Hold us. If not, we will dissolve the EPA. Could you raise your voice? And there's fear yes. being uh, introduced into this topic uh, by the Israeli government. Um, but is it possible that this fear is reality? For instance, uh, the last report I saw about four, estimate of 40,000 uh, rockets uh, by this ballot. Uh, daily, uh, or almost daily rockets uh, from the hospital. Um, you have uh, a situation that you mentioned in Egypt, yeah. which is, uh, seems to me, parallel to what happened in Iran mm -hmm. with the American embassy. Uh, so it seems to me that these are real events. And it not seems to me these are real issues. Mm -hmm. So you want to my comment on, on this? Uh, sure. Yes. Uh, first, I, um, I hope um, that I did not leaving you with the impression that I'm minimizing the threats. These threats, including the ones that you mentioned, are very concrete and real. Fears are not all the time baseless. My point was um, about the role of leadership uh, more than on um, anything else. So, one, Fears are not only spread by the government. Most Israelis are part of this. We are living in a society that you have more like a, 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 a circle um, than like top-down discourse. So you have voices coming from within the society, the government taking something and putting something back into this discourse. So I would say this. Rockets... Uh, are all over Israel, and not only all over Israel. But Israel is not uh, um, a, a weak state. It's, uh, Israel and Israel is not exist only because that uh, some Arab wanted these states to exist or not. But what country would accept rockets coming into the mine? No country. No, 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 no reporter living in any country who would accept it. I it would be just as is afraid, and if you look at uh, Europe, uh, with the bombings that occurred, yeah. there was, but when my, there was actions. I, I completely uh, accept your point. No country and no so society should accept such a situation. But my comment to your point is that you are trying to read rockets outside of any context. Not really. No, no I, uh, let me... They, let they, me they exist. No, no. Real. Of course they exist. Everything is exist in a context. And this is the, maybe the difference between these two reading of the situation. Um, it's like um, it's like for me try to um, uh, read a, a statement uh, outside of the this co the context that this statement is being written or being read, interpreted. And my point is that we should take into account threats, including threats that you uh, already mentioned, but uh, it will not be useful to my mind to just uh, count, you know, numbers of missiles or, or rockets or whatever. So Hezbollah has, um, that's the estimation, something like between 40,000 to 50,000 Rocket, rockets or missiles, some of them can get to north, up to north end of Tel Aviv. So they cover vast part of the northern of Israel, right? Now Israel has more than this numbers of rockets and Israel army is by far more strong than Hezbollah and, and it 
my point, it will not help us to understand how Hezbollah um, um, operating or how Israel is operating just by counting, you know, weapons. Weapons are there, of course. How uh, uh, and when this weapon uh, is being used, this is a question about context. Why Hezbollah is not using these rockets today? It's a question. Yes. I would like an answer to that another day. <laughs> but I would like an answer to that. Why they're not using the, um, yeah. the rockets? I think that's something. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you. I, I missed the beginning, so if you, if you refer to this in the beginning of your talk, I apologize. Um, and, I, and I want to challenge you personally, because I, I Everybody that I talk to is involved in some sort of activity related to the so-called peace process, both mm -hmm. Israel, Palestine, and here, believe the best that can happen in the next year, if anything's going to happen, is to lay the groundwork for an Obama, if you'll excuse me for a moment, an Obama re-election where he gets some religion, decides that he's really going to move in the direction that he feels is the best for, and, and takes the lead in some sort of resolution of the conflict. Um, so I wanted to know your reaction to that thought. And in the, con in the same vein, ask you about organizations such as the Geneva Initiative, yeah. which is doing work every day on the ground, both on the Palestinian side and the Israeli side, and even the Israeli Peace Initiative, which I understand you're a signatory of, yeah. which is trying to make something of what began at the Saudi Peace Initiative, but yeah. now known as the Arab Peace yeah. Okay. The in other words, for those of us who don't believe that the status quo is a good place to be, and still believe that there can be some just and reasonable resolution of the conflict, what can we be doing at this particular moment? Okay, so these are at least three questions in one. I'll try to be uh, uh, very brief. Uh, first, I, 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 my reading is that the Obama administration would like to see a solution. They would like to see a solution. They spent some um, efforts, um, not that success came out of them, but uh, they tried their best. Uh, the one thing that they, I think, missed from the very beginning is the way that, the, that Netanyahu and the Israeli government um, uh, work. And uh, what are they up to? I mean, what is the, the purpose of the discussions themselves. The, the, basic, the basic mistake, the basic mistake of Obama's administration was about uh, the statement of Israel as a Jewish state. And it came in a very, very problematic timing. Now, Netanyahu is not stupid. You asked, so what is new? He kept this card smartly in his pocket. Netanyahu's, uh, Netanyahu did not hide his, you know, agenda about two-state solution, Oslo process in his first term and the second term as prime minister. He, he's not misleading in general his constituencies. He said it from the very beginning. Oslo was a mistake. Two-state solution is very difficult to achieve, if not impossible. Now, he came out under foreign pressures, sometimes very brutal, on him, two discussions. This was very naive to think that because he got to the to the table that he would like to get into a two-state solution. Now, Netanyahu belongs to these leaders in Israel, and Barak is uh, yet another example. All, most of them, I would say the prominent among them, they having a weekly public poll. And they know where the, where the winds you know, move. 
Netanyahu knows very well that you have 60% in general of any Israeli public poll during the last 10 years, about 60% will support two-state solution of the Israelis. But uh, Netanyahu's project is uh, something else. So he's analyzing not the question of this support, 60%. He's checking something very basic. How many among these 60% think that Jerusalem can be divided into two capitals? How many Israelis believe that a return, or close to return, to the 1967 lines is, you know, something positive? How many Israelis would accept a single Palestinian refugee within the borders of Israel? And more difficult, how many Israelis would support a true reconciliation in which Israel will take responsibility for 48 and the creation of the refugee problem. And he knows the answers. And he built his policy very smartly on this, not on the question how many Israelis support two-state solution. Because for most Israelis, two-state solution with the wall, with the separation wall, this is the end game. This is the border. You think we build the wall for dis dismantling the wall? It's a joke. This is the, just people naive outside Israel who think that Israel will dismantle the wall. So the high court here and there, you know, modified, you know, the wall a little bit. Now the other point, why I supported the IPA? I was the, among the, in, actually the first to sign this document. Just for one reason. It's not because I think that two-state solution is reasonable, is, is, is just, or that it's feasible. It's not about this. It's because this was the first Israeli statement, statement that said yes to something that I believe is very promising. And this is the Arab Peace Initiative. This is the first time that I heard head of the Shabak head of Mossad, former ministers, saying to people like me, you know what, you were right to say that we should accept this back in 2002 when it first published. Why? Because there is a recognition of the state of Israel there. Not only by Palestinians. We already have this recognition from the Palestinians. From so just last year, on May, I participated in a meeting, a close meeting, with Egypt, then, this is after the revolution, foreign minister, we were sitting in Cairo, he invited a small group, just five persons, from the signatories of this Israel Peace Initiative, and he said, look, I, I read this, I would like to talk with you about it. Now is the chairman of the Arab League, of course. And we had two hours and a half discussion with, 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 with him and with his staff about this. And he said something very interesting. He said that he does not believe that a serious negotiation on two-state solution between the two parties, I mean Israel and the PA, is something that we should support because this is would not finalized in any good or just agreement. He said, the, he said something that we should think about. The power gap between these two parties is so vast that any time you have a discussion between these two parties, you get into a deadlock. We have been in this situation with the Egyptians and with the Jordanians and many, 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 many times with the Palestinians. So for me, having around the table 
if possible, recognition and participants from the Arab world will change the equation. And therefore, I supported this. So we have time just for one more question. Um, uh, yes, my question is about your comment that the I missed it because now it's coming. My question is about your comment that the overthrow of the Mubarak regime has limited Israel's freedom from the Nineveh. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the terrorist attack in Iran. Did Israel, in fact, attack Gaza in a limited way after that? And uh, haven't there been further calls for yeah. uh, another ma major action against Gaza? Yeah, well, well, exactly this is the point. The, the discussion was about the scope of the, uh, you know, the retaliation or comment. So it was, you have two camps. Many, many among the Israelis were in favor of a major military campaign, a major one, like cast lead. The security apparatus said cast lead is a risk because it's threatening not only sort of discussions with the PA, but mainly because it is um, threatening the very peace treaty with Egypt. So at the end, we had the sort of, um, you probably remember this, um, exchange of acts between these two parties. And we were there, me and my wife. And some rockets land, landed actually very close to the place where we stay. We live very close to Beersheba. So rockets today are coming from, Beersheba, from Gaza to Beersheba easily. So, but, but the point here, is that I would say that within Israel's current, um, maybe I will conclude with this, within the Israeli current leaders and the military apparatus, the question of major campaign in Gaza is not a question of uh, shall we. It's a question of time. They believe that Israel, in, in any simulation game they do, they get to the same conclusion that a, a major campaign in Gaza is uh, mandatory, compulsory on Israel. The major question mark they still have is of course, ramifications, I repeatedly said, peace treaty with, with Egypt. But another secondary maybe question is, so what then? We've been there. We have been there. So what then? You have a military campaign. You will be able to inflict a major harm to Hamas. Are we to stay there? Now, this is something very interesting. Most of the people, leaders in the Likud, do not see today Gaza Strip as part of the Greater Israel or of the project. For them, this is part of, you might see this differently, but this is part of uh, a concession we did. And the price tag for this is that you exclude 1.5 million Palestinians outside of the equation. Well, you've really given us a lot to think about, and I know I've learned a lot from this, as I always do with all of your talks. It's a talks. pleasure. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you again for joining us.